So um, I would present in the next uh, 21 minutes was my limit a paper that I jointly wrote with uh, Lena Klaassen and Uli Gallesdorfer. So Lena is uh, a trained uh, economist and Uli has trained computer scientists. And my background is in uh, environmental policy, climate modeling, um, energy system modeling. Um, so the paper I'm presenting goes back to an idea. So I saw a presentation about uh, the energy consumption of Bitcoin back in 2015 at MIT. And uh, I was wondering what actually the climate implications are, because from a climate perspective, electricity consumption per se doesn't matter, but uh, carbon emissions do. And so uh, the idea was born to actually calculate or estimate the carbon footprint of Bitcoin. The paper that came out of this research was then uh, published last year in uh, June in a journal called Joule. And uh, to be honest, we were quite surprised by the media attention that we received for this paper. So uh, I think it was a Monday when we published the paper and uh, the Sunday night before I received an email from The Guardian uh, asking for, for an interview and I was quite surprised. And then uh, on the Monday when the paper came out, the um, university called me um, and told me that a German TV station wanted an interview and the entire thing escalated throughout the week. So at the end of the week, I received an uh, interview request from CNN and uh, the statement on CNN in the end received more than 1.2 billion views and uh, went through media globally. So in total, we, or not we, but the press office of TU Munich um, counted uh, more than 3 billion visits of the results of this paper, which is quite surprising that people actually care so much about 0.2% uh, of global emissions. Um, but things, but let's jump into the paper and uh, have a, a look at what we actually did. So the plan for today would be to first answer the question why CO2 actually matters. As I mentioned, I'm a trained climate economist and my uh, research focuses on, um, on climate rather than on Bitcoin. Um, second, we wanna, or I would uh, talk about how C uh, Bitcoin actually causes CO2, um, then present the results of our paper, so what the current footprint of Bitcoin is, and if we have some minutes left, also look into how reliable such estimates are. So why does CO2 matter? Um, on this chart, you see the uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, and you can see on this chart that the uh, concentration in the atmosphere has never been that high. Why does this matter? Because uh, greenhouse gases cause global warming. So you have a, a greenhouse gas effect, the more um, greenhouse gases you have in the atmosphere, and this warming is also not um, equally distributed globally. So on this chart number five, you see uh, the temperature anomalies um, over land and over sea. And you see that over land uh, heats up quicker than uh, the sea. And at, uh, at current levels, we are already close to uh, 1.5 degrees warming compared to pre-industrial pre levels. Furthermore, uh, over land, there's also distribution. So if you look at um, and the world map, you see that especially uh, around the poles, there's uh, even a higher temperature anomaly, which kind of scares me uh, considering how much methane and other stuff is uh, tied up in permafrost. So what is the challenge now? So probably most of you are aware of the two degree target, which was published or communicated after the Paris um, COP21 in uh, 2015. So the goal um, that global nations had to limit global warming um, below 1.5 or 2 degree warming. And on this chart, number seven, you see how the emissions would actually have to develop um, to achieve this goal. So on the left side of the chart, you see the historic emissions. So every year we um, emit more CO2 into the atmosphere. And on the right part in, in this band, you see um, how the emissions would have to develop if we want to achieve this 1.5 degree warming target. And you see that basically we should or would have um, to reduce emissions immediately and arrive at um, net zero uh, around mid centuries around 2015. So that's quite a challenge. Um, 
And if you look at what is currently happening, so during the uh, corona pandemic, emissions have dropped. Um, so it's the largest drop since Second World War. Um, but still, we are still on a level comparable to, I think, 2012-ish. So um, that kind of shows how big the challenge is. And uh, we won't solve it by just behavior change, but uh, technology will play a major role in, in this challenge. So this is kind of the, the background, um, why CO2 actually matters. Now you might be wondering what has Bitcoin to do with all of that? Um, easy answer. First of all, Bitcoin, how it's made, and probably most of you know how it works in detail. So the validation algorithm uh, that validates transactions and ownership um, requires a computational intensive um, process. And for this computational intensive process, you need uh, specific hardware. So typically ASIC mining devices are used um, recently and those consume electricity. And the more you have of those, so that's a picture from a mining farm in Iceland, the more you have, obviously the more electricity you need to run those. And electricity, depending on uh, the source, uh, can translate into emissions. So um, the next step, uh, question is then, what is actually the emissions caused by the electricity consumption of um, these mining activities? And our research approach uh, was the following. So first of all, we wanted to calculate the power consumption of Bitcoin and then multiply it with the carbon intensity of the electricity used to derive the carbon footprint. So it uh, looks quite simple, but the devil is in the detail of uh, collecting all the data that is needed to derive this result. So uh, for instance, key inputs uh, to derive the power consumption are the hardware in use and the uh, manufacturers of uh, mining devices are typically quite sensitive with that data. Um, and you also need to know how efficient these uh, operations are. So depending on the size of mining, if you have a a uh, small mining farm compared to a large one, you have auxiliary losses or you have less auxiliary losses. And on the carbon intensity side, that's the tricky part. You need to understand uh, which carbon emission factor actually to apply for the electricity. So for the electricity consumption, I won't go through that in detail, but this was our basic approach to calculate an upper and a lower bound. So we assumed for a upper bound of electricity, we assumed that um, the miners use all their revenues um, to buy electricity. And for the lower bound, we assumed all uh, miners to use the most efficient hardware. And we also calculated a best guess, which included further assumptions and which we uh, consider as our uh, or best guess scenario. So this was the approach, so threefold approach to estimate electricity consumption. And um, there were a lot of information which we needed to actually do so. And we were quite lucky because during the time we conducted the study, uh, three major producers of ASICs um, announced their IPOs, so their initial public offerings, which uh, required them to publish data which they hadn't done previously. And so based on their IPO filings, we could estimate which hardware they actually had sold, which gave us information on the efficiency of the hardware used in the network, which allowed us to derive the electricity consumption. We had a few further inputs to do so. And so one was um, the pool size. Um, so from pool shares, we derived um, the size of the single miners, and we also conducted a bunch of interviews to understand how mining operations actually work. So that's that's a screenshot from a data scraping we did uh, on Slush Pool, which probably some of you know. So this is a mining pool, and we recorded the hash power contributed by single users to classify miners into three size buckets: so small miners, medium miners, and large miners. And depending on the size of mining operations, we included a PUE, so a, a power um, utility effectiveness, so meaning auxiliary losses. So a um, simple example, if you mine at home, you can open up your window. You don't need uh, additional cooling. If you have a large mining farm, you need cooling. Um, and if you have a very large mining farm, your cooling will be more efficient than in a medium-sized mining farm. So this was the basic idea behind that one. Um, 
So this chart shows uh, the distribution of the pools in the Bitcoin network at the time, the end of 2018. And um, we classified these pools to say, for instance, private pools uh, were then classified as large scale uh, mining because they were uh, typically privately owned mining pools. And that was uh, how we derived the electricity consumption, which you see on that chart. So these are the, uh, the lower bounds, so the technological uh, lower bound, the economic upper limit and our best guess estimate, which was uh, 45.8 terawatt hours annually at that point in time, end of 2018. So now the second part of the calculation, the interesting one, um, in order to translate electricity consumption into carbon emissions, you need to know where your electricity is consumed. And we applied, uh, we calculate three scenarios to actually derive the geographic footprint of Bitcoin mining. And so our first approach was um, based on uh, server IPs, so pool server IPs. So we uh, recorded and monitored uh, the data that was provided by mining pools to derive a distribution between Asia, Europe, and America. Second, we used uh, device IPs. So we used a IoT search engine called Shodan IO um, to actually localize uh, mining IPs, and so IP addresses of mining devices with a certain configuration. And our third approach, which we uh, didn't use in the paper in the end was to set up our own node in the network and record um, the blocks that were uh, relayed. So based on the scenario that we derived, we then wanted to calculate the carbon uh, emissions. And this one is actually tricky, so it looks quite simple. So to calculate the carbon emissions from electricity consumption, you need to know how carbon intensive your electricity is. And here the challenge begins, depending on which lens you take. So you can say, for instance, I mine next to a renewable power source. So I'm mining next to a wind farm. I am renewable. Or you could say from a system perspective, um, I'm consuming the average carbon intensity of the electricity in the respective grid. Or you could say um, I'm causing with my mining additional load. And the marginal emissions that I cause are the coal-fired power plants, so the last one and the merit order that is actually added to fulfill my load. And that is quite tricky. And that's also where the discussion starts. And there are a lot of guesses out there which uh, deviate quite a lot. And um, from so we took the system perspective and used an average emission factor in the end um, to derive our results, which was then 22. A megaton of CO2 annually, which is comparable to a major city. So I think we had Kansas City as an example um, that emits a similar amount of carbon. So how reliable are such estimates? Um, as I already mentioned, the challenge is to get the emission factor right, because if you assume um, mining next to a renewable energy source is uh, carbon-free, then your carbon footprint is much lower. If you take the uh, perspective of mining is adding loads to the, to the grid, then you end up with a much higher carbon intensity. So that's quite, quite a challenging one. And you could also ask, so what? Now you calculated the carbon emissions, so what? Um, there are much larger sources of carbon emissions, definitely. Um, and this research was also the starting point to look into other data centers that um, require more electricity, Etc. So it's, I think it's a nice example to see um, that technology, uh, technological innovation uh, also requires looking at externalities. And um, the conclusion here is not that uh, we should ban Bitcoin or uh, regulate mining or something like that, but it shows the general problem. So from an economic perspective, the most uh, cost effective way would be to um, to use a carbon price to actually internalize the externalities that reside from these carbon emissions. And um, the, the problem is not Bitcoin per se, but the problem, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, is the general greenhouse gas emission level. Having said that, I think I'm quite close to the 21 minutes and I would uh, stop my presentation at that point. Thanks.